What's up, William Mary? What's up? What's up, Colleen? All right, so um, one of the things we do at UVA uh, at One Way is when I say, what's up, William and Mary, you guys say, what's up, Charlene, OK? I want to hear it with a little bit more gusto. All right, so what's up, William and Mary? What's, what's up, Charlene? Fellowship at the University of Virginia. So I came on staff last year after running from my call for four years. Yes. And the, the irony of the whole matter is I went and hid in seminary. <laughs> so I'm grateful that the grace of God meets us where we are and slowly brings us back. So some things you should note about me is I am arguably five, five and three quarters. It's debatable. Sometimes I'm five, six. Uh, I was born and raised in Northern Virginia, in Woodbridge to be specific, uh, and I graduated from UVA in 2008. So when I came to UVA, I wasn't a Christian, and I was raised in a pretty agnostic home. My dad said, you can do whatever you want in life, just don't become a Christian. So I took that to heart. He, um, he would take us by churches on Sundays, and we would sit outside and laugh at how uh, People needed someone to tell them how to live their lives, and uh, we thought that that was foolishness. So when I got to UVA, out of desperation for community and wanting to, uh, wanting to find a place to fit, as well as a, a slew of racial incidences that happened my first year at UVA, I was looking for community and a place to be. And the Lord led me to singing in the gospel choir called Black Voices, as well as... Um, what is now One Way Christian Fellowship, so a ministry that, that, that reaches out to black students on campus. And it was there in that ministry that God slowly started to transform my life and turn my heart to him in a way that I had never anticipated. I thought I was just singing and I'd go to the back of the campus ministry meeting and I would wait for them to be done so I could hang out with them because I wasn't interested in their God, but I was interested in their community. And uh, the Lord uh, showed me something really compelling, that he was in their midst, and that the kind of love they showed one another was, uh, was good and right, and that he was inviting me into that. So that's how I became a Christian. And I went to seminary at Duke. Do we have any Duke? Well, I guess not. We don't have any Dukes in the house. Uh, I, I went to seminary at Duke, and uh, I graduated with a Master's of Divinity, which uh, basically means that I've mastered the divine. I wrestled with God, and I won. <laughs> It's, it's a joke. <laughs> uh, it means that I, I have training to, uh, to be a pastor. So a couple things I love. I usually have slides for this, but uh, not, I, I couldn't think that way today. A couple things I love. One is Jesus. Yeah. Two, I love writing. Three, I really love Twitter. And uh, four, I love the Michael Jackson experience on the Wii. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and last but not least, I have a really big heart for university. So those things are not always in that order, but I feel like the Lord is teaching me how to put them rightly. <laughs> so I was asked to speak on the topic of beauty tonight, and I'm excited about it, inner and outer beauty. Uh, it didn't take me too long to come up with a talk. Uh, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Now stop judging each other because God loves you, right? That's it, I'm done. Uh, I threw in some scripture in there, dropped the mic, walks off stage. <laughs> Uh, but the more and more I thought about inner and outer beauty, the more I thought about how God never really uh, places value on how things appear. This is actually quite different from the way the West, or specifically America, thinks about beauty. When asked to define beauty, we think about people or things that are pretty, that are handsome, that look great. We look at our TV crushes, we look at movies, uh, and we look, about what's, we look at what's attractive about those things. So I googled People Magazine's most attractive people, and what you get is, at number one, is Beyonce. Yes. <laughs> at number one is Beyonce, and then somewhere in the mix is like all three Jonas Brothers appear in separate spots, right? Uh, then you have Brad Pitt and Natalie Portman. Yes. So it's about... <laughs> Uh, this, this idea of beauty is all about our eyes and what's most satisfying to our eyes, right? We are a culture that likes to look at things. And yet all of our perceptions of beauty are far from the way that God thinks about beauty. 
So what if I told you that the Lord doesn't really care about outward appearances? What if I told you that your heart and your soul matter most to God? The funny thing about God is that he doesn't see things the way that we do. And that's actually a good thing, that God sees us with a different set of eyes. So as we talk about beauty tonight, I hope that the Lord will start to give us new eyes for how to view creation and how to view each other. So uh, I want to start with Jeremiah 1. And I, did, I didn't tell you which version, so if I'm reading a different version, it's because that's not the version of the book. Okay. All right, so the call of Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my, my words in your mouth. See today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and to tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. So let's pray. God, I'm so grateful to be here tonight, uh, grateful to be uh, with my brothers and sisters from William and Mary. I pray that God, as we uh, think and uh, listen to your voice about what you have to say about inner and outer beauty, uh, that, God, you would give us new eyes to see. God, would you do a work in our hearts? And, Lord, I pray that the, the, the words of my lips and the meditation of my heart would be, uh, would be good in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so there are many things I love about prophets, and specifically Jeremiah. Jeremiah has this great story of hearing from the Lord for the first time, and a challenge is set before him, right? God tells him to go do something. And it seems like he has no choice, because regardless of what he looks like, or how old he is, or his qualifications, he was called before birth by God. It's hard for us to comprehend that God can use us, right? God can use little old Thurston from Hampton, or God can use Kevin from Uptown, uh, or that God can use someone like me from Northern Virginia. It seems like every time the Lord calls someone or anyone to serve him, their first inclination is, what the what? Right? <laughs> the ha huh comes from uh, those who are closest to us, right? Family, friends, acquaintances. And sometimes the ha huh comes from within, right? It's, it's we can't see it, so we're like, what? Are you sure? But can, can we be honest tonight? Is that okay? Yeah? All right. Uh, when we look at people, let alone we look at ourselves, right? We judge by what we see and what we hear. It's all about our senses. Our world today operates using a bunch of checklists, right? Rate the following. So attractiveness, class or social status, money, uh, GPA, success. These are the ways that we view beauty. These are the ways that we view, this is the way that we perceive the world. So we want to see proof of what God's doing, and somehow we always end up on those things. And these are tangible ways of measuring the call. Or we make proof for why the call doesn't matter and why it shouldn't exist. So when we look in the mirror, we miscalculate what we see. We feel the weight of God's glory. And like Jeremiah, we say, uh, I think you have the wrong person. Or we just laugh it off and say, God, why are you kidding? <laughs> and I tend to err on the side of self-loathing. Oh, Lord, I'm just worthless. Try someone else. I'm not ready. As a matter of fact, I have a list of about 20 other people that you can contact if you're just leaving your life. <laughs> Well, it appears that this is every single person in Scripture who the Lord calls to serve them. So here we have the prophet Jeremiah who basically says, No, really, you don't know me. You don't know what I've done. You don't know the things I've said. You don't know what I've been through. I'm just a child. Leave me alone. So how many times have you said, God, I'm just fill in the blank? It's true. We all do it. Lead a small group. Oh, I'm not Christian enough. <laughs> Share your faith. I'm not a theologian or a religion major. I don't do that. I can, I can, and then I won't. Right. So, um, Part of, uh, part of my story is that um, when the Lord started to change my life, uh, my first year of college, 
uh, it scared me a whole lot, right? I knew that like there was this perception of what a Christian is supposed to look like. Uh, our, our chapter president, president, like it felt like he woke up every morning at like 5 a.m. to pray, and that kind of scared me. And I was like, oh, that's so beautiful. Look at him. He's just, you know, he's got it all together. And I thought that that was like the perception of like awesomeness, that like God was going to rapture him up one day just like Elijah, and it was going to be awesome. <laughs> um, and what I was beginning to see is that uh, God starts with our hearts, right? God wants a willing heart. And when I was able to say, okay, it's not about the outside appearance of things, it's about what God's doing on the inside, that's when I started to notice the Lord doing something different. Because the truth is, our perception is really off. When we look at others and even ourselves, right, we don't see everything. Our eyes can't tell us everything. So how many times have you looked in the mirror and focused in on that single blemish, that zit, that misplaced hair that you can't get to stick down even though you keep putting that hair mousse thing on it. <laughs> I don't know about that, so. Um, or when was the last time that you avoided looking in the mirror, mirror because you couldn't stand to look at yourself, right? Um, our perceptions are off, and our focus is on every physical flaw. We see every failure of our past, every average grade, and every under average grade. We see missed opportunities, and we feel anger and rage. So we judge the quality of a person, place, or thing, huh? now, uh -huh. person, place, or thing. Uh, by what we can perceive with our senses. So if beauty is in the eye of the beholder, then either there is something wrong with our eyes, or we need a new definition of what this beauty is. And this is where we find ourselves in Jeremiah. Jeremiah looked at himself and said, whoa, you've got the wrong person. But when God looks at something, he doesn't do so with the same eyes that we do. God responds to Jeremiah's questioning his call and says, don't say, I'm just a child. God responds to Jeremiah in the same way that he responds to us. When God looks at us, he doesn't see our, uh, he doesn't see our blemishes. He says, no, like you are mine. You are my creation. You are my beloved. And you have been purposed for something in particular. God looks at us and thinks, you don't have to be a religious professional or a perfect disciple. You just have to be willing to follow me. The disciples, for instance, were this ragtag group of 12 men, right? A bunch of, a bunch of blue collar working men who made a living off something that was unpredictable, which was fishing. This ragtag group would be the ones who would take the gospel to the ends of the world, right? The beauty of this great story is that it repeats itself through scripture with every person called by God. That God doesn't care about how we look or our past, right? He, he cares, but not in a way that like, uh, discriminates against who's who. Uh, but God wants our heart. He wants folks who are willing to give it up for him, his mission, and his kingdom. So we often think that, what we, uh, that we need our external appearances to kind of wrap up and be all nice, uh, but this was precisely the problem with the Pharisees in the gospel, right? The Pharisees, they looked religious. They looked like they had it all together. They knew how to obey the laws. They knew how to pray openly in the streets and make other people feel like they weren't so religious. So while the Pharisees looked right, their hearts were far from Jesus. They had all the makings and the lookings of great religious people, and at the same time, looks are deceiving. And that's oftentimes what we try to do, right? So we try to look, be, or act a certain, act a certain way. We take certain classes or pick our majors based on uh, where they can lead us. Uh, we struggle with eating disorders or give ourselves up to be used emotionally, physically, or, um, or mentally by others. We only consider jobs that will give us prestige. And we can't say who we are clearly because we don't know. And last but not least, our definition of success is house, spouse, fence, kids, two-car garage, and if you're me, pool. <laughs> um, yeah, and we think that we need certain credentials to be who we are, that that somehow will, will give us this facade of beauty. And the truth is that we would rather hide behind these things uh, than unveil them before God. And this is where Jeremiah is. Will he stand before God?
So we aspire to have an outward appearance of attractiveness that is ultimately inward focused. Uh, it's all about me, myself, and I. And last night I was chatting with Thurston, who some of you guys might know, and he said uh, the thing about beauty is we often have to compromise our souls to secure or obtain it. And he's right, the moment that we think we need to pull ourselves together to look a certain way or to do things a certain way, uh, we make ourselves our own God, right? It's all about satisfying our unquenchable appetite that will never subside. But like God's standards are different. Across the Bible, we go from Moses to Deborah, David, Mary, Joseph, and Paul. They are not much to look at. In fact, they're far from the pictures of elegance or prestige that we might imagine. Qualification and ability is not based on what we can offer, do, or be, right? The gift and the beauty of it is that God's call is irrevocable. He formed you in your mother's womb. He knew everything that you would do and be, and he still says, yes, you. You are very good, and you are mine. So our beauty rests in the fact that God still chooses us amidst all of our junk. And what we don't understand is that inward beauty shows on the outside and it blesses others, right? When, uh, when God confronts Jeremiah and says, hey, you, I'm calling you, right? It wasn't just like, a, you're special to me. It was, you're special to me, and now, like, go out and share my name with those who don't know me. Go out and bless others. They might not see it as a blessing, and they'll probably look at you and say, oh, he's pretty young, but go out and bless others with this message. First Samuel says uh, in chapter 16, when they're uh, picking the, the, the new king, so Saul's just been rejected, and David uh, is about to be anointed, and Samuel goes out to, to anoint him. Uh, Samuel starts looking at um, all of David's brothers, right? He starts with the oldest brother, and he's like, oh, well, he looks like a king, talks like a king, uh, he might be a king, and God's like, no, I don't look at outward appearances. Like, I look at the heart, and Samuel's like, okay, well, it must be the second, you know, the second oldest. Like, he's, he looks pretty good, too. And they go through all the sons, and I can imagine, like, um, them, like, sitting in the living room, and Jesse's like, all right, guys, catwalk, catwalk, show Samuel what you got. <laughs> and uh, Jesse's like, yeah, that's my boy. And uh, they go through all of that, and uh, Samuel's still like, okay, is this, are these all your sons? Because God says that it's none of them. They, they look great, but it's none of them. And um, uh, Samuel asks Jesse, like, who else do you have? And Jesse says, oh, I got, I got this runt, like this, you know, this, my youngest son, he's caring for the sheep, but he's a runt, like, are you sure? And he says, yeah, we'll wait, we'll wait around until we can go get him. And so uh, they send some people out to go get David, and David comes in, and um, not only does he have, I, I guess scripture says he was handsome, right? He had light eyes or something like that. Um, but he, he uh, God saw his heart, and that's how, uh, that's what led him to be king. So he's anointed, not just because of his physical appearance, but because he has the heart to serve as king. So when God looks at us, it's more than appearances. He sees his beloved creation, and it's very good. When God looks at us, it isn't about our past or our prestige. It's about our relationship, and that's his sons and daughters of the Most High God. You don't have to be a religious uh, professional or a perfect disciple. You just have to be willing to follow God with your whole heart. And when God looks at us, he sees us amidst all of our junk, and he still says, you are mine. So the beauty of call is that God doesn't care what we look like or our past or our age, right? God wants our hearts. He wants people who are willing to follow him uh, in mission and for, the, for his kingdom. Uh, call is not based on prettiness, qualification, or likability and skill, but on the gracious gift of God. Because the truth is that in college, you can create whatever kind of identity you like for yourself. You can be whatever you want to be while you're here, and you can spend the rest, of, uh, the rest of your four years here, or how many years you have left, showing off what you think others might want to see. Or, you can be you and let the Lord use you. So, let's pray. God, we are um, grateful to be in your midst this evening. Thank you for the words that you've spoken. I pray that as we think about inner and outer beauty uh, tonight and for the rest of the week, that you would remind us that our first and primary
calling is as children of God, that you are the one who bestows beauty on your children, uh, that we are beautiful because we are yours. And as we continue just to worship tonight, I pray that God, you would remind us that uh, for those of us who are struggling to see ourselves as, as beautiful, that God, uh, you would just give us clarity, that you would speak those words very clearly to us tonight. In Christ's name I pray.